Amen. Singleness of vision is so important in ministry. When I was a young call porter, one of my call porter leaders told us a story that I've never forgotten. It was just a simple story, but it was about a chief of a village who needed to choose uh, an, a, the heir of the village, who would be the next chief. And uh, by uh, tragedy, his oldest son had died, and he had two men that he had uh, selected to um, possibly fulfill the role of chief of the village, but he wanted to, to uh, carefully select this important role, and so he took them out into a uh, jungle where there were uh, many birds and uh, wild creatures. This was a place somewhere in South America where there was a lot of a lot of trees and if you can imagine a tribe in South America with uh, little bow and arrows and shooting wild animals and things and this chief uh, had these two men look up into a, a tall canopy a tree uh, along the perhaps along the Amazon River and he said to both of them he said look up into that tree and tell me what you see and and he asked the uh, first young man what is it that you see there and uh, the young man said, well, I see a tree. He says, pull out your bow and your arrow. And so the young man pulls his bow and he looks up. And he says, now tell me, what do you see? He says, I see the limbs of the tree. And he says, now what do you see? He says, I see the leaves of the tree. And he says, what again do you see? He says, I, I see a bird. And he says, what do you see? He says, I see some more limbs. So he said, put down your bow and arrow. Then he asked the second man, he says, look up over into that tree, what do you see? And he says, I see the eye of a bird. And he says, raise your bow. And he says, now what do you see? And he says, I see the eye of a bird. And he says, look again, what do you see? He says, I see the eye of a bird. And he says, shoot. And he let go of the arrow and it, it struck the bird and the bird fell. And the chief said, I will select you as the next chief of this village because you have singleness of vision. And I never forgotten that story from the time when I was about 17 years old because it was so uh, unique. And it tells the story about the importance of singleness of vision. And this is one characteristic that Jesus had was a singleness of purpose. It was 1,990 years ago that Jesus fell. What do I mean? He fell. There he struggled down the Via Della Rosa. And if you were to go to Jerusalem today, you could still walk on that same road uh, where Jesus would have walked when the cross was put upon him, and there he struggled, having been beaten, having stayed up all night, having been put before uh, literally kings, King Herod and Pilate, having pieces of his beard pulled out from him, having been spat upon, and now they take this cross and say, walk, and here he is marching through this crowded city with people jeering and leering at him, and Jesus collapsed under the weight of that heavy wooden beam. Why was Jesus doing that? We call that event Jesus' passion. And today they have passion plays around the world, different dramas and things, celebrating Jesus' singleness of purpose. Did he have options? He said, right when Judas came to betray him and all the men fell back, he said, could I not call a thousand angels, a legion of angels, if I wanted to? Jesus had options, but he didn't choose those options. He chose to continue to press on the hard way. This morning for our worship, I want to just take a moment to focus your vision, just like a uh, that, that young chieftain was focused on the eye of the bird. I want you to think about the passion of Christ because 
his passion was very clear. He had one thing on his mind, to be together with us. In fact, in Philippians, it says, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. Now think about that for a moment. What, what was the joy that was before him? It was reunion. For the joy that was ahead of the cross, beyond the cross, he endured the cross. And the joy was that you and I and all the Turkish people around you and all the Saudi Arabian people around you and the Lebanese people and the Moroccan people, that he could somehow capture them. The joy was the salvation that he would see them when they would be free from their sins. We must focus on that, friends. We must focus that Jesus is the solution to all of the problems of this world. He is the solution for every individual problem and the heartache. And when you meet your friends and they're, they're discouraged, they're depressed, when you wake up and you feel lonely, when you feel Jesus is the solution, and he is working out in wonderful ways his solution in people's lives. We see this same passion in God's uh, final book in Revelation 21 when God says, Now the dwelling of God is with men. That's the ultimate purpose, that we can be together in the same place, to be together. And it, it, as you think about Jesus under the crushing weight of that cross, laying in the street, soldier kicking him in his side, saying, Get up! Jesus had one thing on his mind, to be together, to be together. Reunion. Jesus is all about people. That's his mission. That's, that's what he is all about. And though um, as humans, we have a hard time really... Uh, fully grasping that type of love. We have little bits of pieces of, of that love in a mother's love, a mother that would die for her children or a father that would rush into a burning house to get his, his babies out of the house. We even see it in animals. The stories are told about birds that would sit over and hover over their little babies while forest fire rages over because of love. And somehow there is this protective love, and Jesus had it. And the fact that he was, uh, you know, abused, he's hanging on the cross, and he could still utter words of, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. We can't really fathom that kind of love. It, it's beyond us. If you can just take a moment to consider the scene of the cross, if you could hear the sounds, the, uh, the noise of the angry crowd, there's the groans and the sobs of women at the base of the cross looking up. Jesus's mother was probably not the only mother there. There could have been the thieves' uh, mothers there as well. And of course, the anguish of those who loved him, like Mary Magdalene, looking up and just crying, crying. There's the smell of sweat and blood and urine and the stink of other bodies that had been discarded from the crosses of previous times. It, it had to be an awful thing. And that we were told there was vinegar there in, in uh, some sort of buckets. And so it was a very... Uh, the smell and the stench of the moment was very, very real. If you could just imagine for a moment the, the scene of the sky as the clouds are rolling in, we're told that there was darkness. And did, how did that darkness come about? It was a supernatural darkness or were there rolling clouds that would block out the sun? Maybe the sun just for a moment gave out because in the death of its creator, it bowed its own head. The source of its own uh, strength was dying there on the cross. It was color 
abundance as red blood flowed and oozed from the sores that had been beaten onto these men, the lacerations, the spikes in Jesus's forehead dripping blood down his face, the flash of red from the Roman Empire on the helmets and on the skirts of the men there. Can you see the scene of the cross? And yes, near the cross, there were the two thieves. And we're told about these two, two thieves in such uh, detail. If you just take a moment in the book of Luke, Luke 23 and verses 39. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. Verse 40. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence, we are punished justly for what we are getting, what our deeds deserve, but this man has done nothing wrong. Verse 42, then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. I just pause right there for a moment. How did this thief know that Jesus had done nothing wrong? Perhaps this thief had followed Jesus. Maybe this thief had actually been a pickpocket at the Sermon on the Mount. <laughs> Maybe he had, had come out where the crowds were because he could make money off of them. Maybe he'd been robbing a house. We'd watched people who had gone out to see Jesus and knew where they were coming from and knew that they were going to be gone all day. And so he had robbed their house. We don't know, but somehow this man had had previous contact with Jesus, and he heard Jesus. He'd watched Jesus. Maybe he had seen Jesus heal a blind man, and Jesus laid his hands on Bartimaeus, and the thief stood back and looked at him. He'd seen, been in the crowd, maybe when they picked up stones to stone the woman, and the thief looked and watched Jesus' character. He gazed into his eyes. And looked at him. Maybe he had spoken with Matthew or with Peter or John. And this thief knew something about Jesus. And when the other thief uh, railed its insults on Jesus, he jumped to defend Christ. And he says, uh, Don't you fear God since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly for what we are getting, what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. In that is really the gospel story, because as you know, working in a Muslim area, we all have a balanced scale where if our good deeds outweigh our bad deeds, we are going to go to heaven. But we all have a, a scale of where we get what our deeds deserve. And that means that we all are not good enough. And that's exactly what the thief was trying to measure out here. He said, I, I am getting what I deserve. Now, why the reason I bring up this story is for these words of Jesus, as he looks at the thief next to him, who just in awesome faith asked Jesus to remember him when he comes into his kingdom. And Jesus says in verse 43, I tell you the truth today, you will be with me in paradise. That's the whole mission of Jesus. Be with me. Jesus didn't say you will be in heaven. Or he didn't say you will live forever. He didn't say you will, you will go on uh, into paradise 
He said, you will be with me. And this is the whole point of, of Jesus's ministry. We see it in John chapter 17. Go there, uh, John 17 and verse John 17 and verse 24. Verse 24 says, Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you love me before the creation of the world. Wouldn't you like to have your parents to see where you're at in Morocco or to see your parent, have your parents see you in Istanbul? Why? You love them. You, you know they're proud of you and you'd love to show off just a little bit of what life is like in Jordan or what life is like in Egypt. And, you know, to, to have them experience a little bit of the trouble, a little bit of the hardship, a little bit of what culture that you have endured walking and trampling on the streets there. Can you imagine Jesus in glory, walking on the streets of the gold, surrounded by angels, having the salute and attention of a thousand worlds. And Jesus says, I want you to be with me. I've come down here and experienced what you have. Now you come and experience what I know as a reality. And he says, I don't just want to show you the, the heaven from a distance. He says, I sit at the right hand of God, and I've got a seat right here next to me reserved. You come and experience it so that from the very vantage of my eyeballs, you can see the universe. Come and be with me. I remember as a boy, one of my greatest pleasures was riding with my dad on his motorcycle. And uh, he didn't put me on the back of his motorcycle where I could fall off and where my vision would only be his shoulder blades. He put me right up in front and I'd sit on the gas tank and we would drive around and it was wonderful with the wind flying through my hair and bugs just dodging as I, we were going super fast and I could see everything from my dad's point of view and his hands on the handlebar and my hands right in between his and we're driving through the forest and up through the hills on that motorcycle. It felt so good to be with my dad. And Jesus says, come and be with me and experience my world, experience my life. A thousand nine hundred and ninety years ago, Jesus fell and bled and suffered. For the joy, for the joy, he endured the cross. And that joy is you and I. And I think it's just really important, uh, Waldensian students, that we keep the cross ever in mind of what, what it is all about. And, you know, we use the cross as an emblem throughout the centuries. You see Christians having crosses on churches and crosses in chapels, and you go into old caves and you see like we saw in, in Cappadocia, Cappadocia, because everybody knows that the cross is the central point of everything. It's the eye of the bird. And it's very possible for us in our 21st century where we think that the eye of the bird is the small group. We think that the eye of the bird is the, is the vegan lifestyle. We think that the eye of the bird is the, is the uh, memorization of scriptures. Or it, somehow, if we could just get an intercessory prayer list that would be stronger, we could just somehow uh, really get that, that nice-looking CV with uh, uh, you know, all of these different uh, accomplishments. If we could just get that that degree, if we could just get married, maybe that's the eye of the bird. And we forget that the eye, the whole thing, the whole of life, the fact that we ever get off this planet is wound up right there in the cross. And that all that you have to offer 
to anybody that you ever talk to. It's not about the Adventist lifestyle. It's not about the Adventist heritage. It's not about our interpretations of prophecy. It's not about the legacy of the Protestant movement. It's not about us against Catholics. It's not even about the second coming of Christ. The only ch chance that we have to get off of this planet is what happened on the cross and that Jesus shed his blood and by faith in the gift of Jesus' blood, there is hope. And that blood, it was pure blood. It was the lamb that was to be sacrificed. It was the prophetic gift from the time of, of Adam and Eve being clothed just at the gates of Eden and had been told through Noah and through Abraham, there will come a lamb. Jesus was the lamb of God. And we must focus, focus our days and focus the people who we are teaching right there at that moment of what is the significance of the cross of Jesus Christ. Faith sprouted in that thief. I don't know where it all began. I somehow think it was before he was on the cross. But maybe it was the thief watching Jesus through the trial. There he was tied to a post, chained to a, a wall, and he's watching Jesus being beaten. Maybe he was even nearby when Jesus was speaking to Pilate and said, my kingdom is not of this world. Wow. Suddenly the thief catches it. His kingdom is not of this world. And so there on the cross, he could say, when you come into your kingdom, Lord. And that's what we have to live our daily lives, Waldensian students. Our, our existence is not of this world. We're getting grades. We're interacting with teachers and professors. And yeah, we, we have to you know, pay the taxes on our cell phone and whatever daily stuff you're dealing with. You got to watch out for, for uh, uh, the broken sidewalk that you don't trip and fall and, and this daily problems. But we're not really part of this world. Jesus said, if my disciples were of this world, they would fight to prevent my arrest. He was already elevating the disciples into a fourth dimension. And that's kind of how we're supposed to live, in a different dimension, a different world. Aiming that we will be together. When we sit with your, when you sit with your Bible study contacts, that's where our, that's where our focus has got to be, that we're going to be together with God. I think as I sat so many times with my uh, friends, the idea of being with God kind of blew their mind because there is this goal and aspiration in the Christian faith. Jesus mentions it in the Beatitudes that we're going to see God face to face. He said, blessed are the meek for they shall see God. And of course, we know the stories of Moses seeing God. But for the Muslim, the goal is a little different. It's to go to paradise that God would still be somehow separate and distant. And yet there's something specially appetizing about understanding that there is a Father that cares for us and that we can be together with Him. And as you begin to un veil the pleasures of your heart about being with God. Something that, that primate desire to worship comes into the heart of your Bible study, uh, and they long for that as well. That I could be in the presence of God. We can't do it on our own holiness, but we can do it by the power of Christ.
well, I put together a few notes and now I find they're sort of a distraction to me. I've just been talking to you here from my heart. Words be with me are somewhat of romantic words, aren't they? Come and be with me. It's a, uh, it's the romance of God. Close with a story. When I was a young man, I traveled to Romania and uh, communism had just fallen. It was a time where there were a lot of orphans in Romania and uh, street children. And it was really sad to see because the kids had been abandoned by their moms and dads. Um, and they were living in the streets, a lot of them sniffing glue out of plastic bags. Their life was so hard. Uh, many of them had open wounds because they would be attacked by rats when they were sleeping in the streets. The kids would have rings around their face where the glue, uh, the bags that they had been sniffing glue had left uh, and their minds had someone been eaten out by that, that toxic drug. And uh, I visited a Adra man there. Uh, he was a young guy, only about 29 years old. And uh, he said, I'm preparing to adopt a 12 year old girl. And I said, well, man, David, I said, that's uh, really unusual. I said, you're a single guy. Why are you adopting this, this girl? And he says, I, I, I have to. He says, I just can't live with the thought of her getting raped every night in the streets. And uh, he says, come and, and uh, him and this little girl, she was now living in his house and he was working through the paperwork. He said, we'll take food to her brothers. They still live in a sewage drainage ditch. And so we walked down in the streets of Bucharest and came to the large open sewer. And there was this pipe that was about two meters in diameter. And we looked down into the darkness and this little girl, she called out uh, to her brothers. And her voice echoed down into this tube. And then she stepped back and very quickly, some sounds of pattering feet came. And here came boys, three, four, five years old. And uh, we opened up our little picnic lunch. They had just rags on their bodies. And uh, they quickly devoured the bread and the food that we had brought. And it was such a scene of sadness. And yet such a scene of love. Here was one child that had been adopted, sharing bread with those that had not been adopted. And I think, well, then seeing students that we must think about our lives in terms of giving the cross of Christ. I've often heard it said as one beggar showing another beggar where to find bread we come to the cross because we need grace, and that's the only source in the universe. And we've got to figure out how to bring people to the foot of the cross of Christ. And yes, if the Bible isn't accepted, if Jesus is only a prophet, if Jesus got off the cross and escaped through the back door, all these are obstacles. Why did anybody ever come up with these kind of stories? It's because Satan doesn't want people to go to the cross. People are being lost. Men and women are being lost. And if we could just see uh, how rapidly Satan is stealing men's and women's souls, 
if we could understand the urgency of the hour, is if there was a, a man who had fallen into a Niagara Falls and there he is floating down the river, he's moving swiftly towards the falls. Does anybody have a rope? Is there a boat? Is there any way that we can get some help for this man? There he's moving swiftly through the current. We hear his voice cry out, help, somebody help me. The only problem is in our ministry is nobody's crying out, help, help me. They're flowing downstream towards death, towards the destruction. And only we have the perspective to understand how real that is. So my plea today is as you work in your ministry, consider the lost and paint the vivid picture of a Christ who wants to be with us, that there is a loving place, a place of safety, a seat at the right hand of God, and it's been prepared for, for you, for I, for your friends. Make that so inviting and so available that no one would want to turn it down. God bless you, friends. Thank you for listening this morning's worship. Let's have a word of prayer, shall we? Our kind Heavenly Father, thank you that we can have these treasured words of Jesus to the thief on the cross. I tell you this day, you will be with me in paradise. And isn't that the surety of salvation that we all long for and that our Muslim friends lack? How could Jesus give such a promise other than that he knew it was true? Lord, this is what we need to give to those around us, is this surety flowing from the cross, flowing from that abundant uh, life, the stream of life. Thank you, Lord, that uh, you give us friends. We pray that we could be good stewards of those friendships. And uh, Lord, give us creativity to know, know how to turn and conversation in a, in a positive direction. Lord, we so often lack even the very simplest words to describe the emotions that we feel inside of us. How frustrating it is to sit with somebody and not be able to, to talk about that which is so urgent and so valuable. Lord, I pray for spiritual gifting. I pray for uh, linguistic gifting for these Waldensian students. Lord, I, I love their passion. I pray that their passion would yield fruit and productivity and usefulness. Lord, I know that part of their mission is reshaping them and building a character for the next job that they have. And I, I just pray, Lord, that you would uh, continue to keep them on that grinding wheel to sharpen them for all that you intend in their life. Thank you so much, Lord. I pray these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen.